This is a Simon Fraser product, let's say, between Wolfgang Heder and Murray. And they decided that we connect the presentation to the Mercedes marketing on uh, using the term Uber, Uber EA, that means an environmental impact assessment on a higher level, and we were talking about that uh, across Europe. First of all, I would like to integrate uh, the subject in the overall planning process in, in Europe and in each country. We have one column in the field of conservation environmental planning, field of protected areas, then protection of species, then uh, landscape planning, and at least, and you see that's the youngest instruments in landscape planning and environmental planning is the impact assessment, and here we will focus on the instrument of uh, SEA. <coughs> On the other hand, I would like to focus during that presentation on the influence of the European directives, uh, which have an influence on the planning culture in Europe. What is a directive? A directive is um, a, a kind of law, European lo law, which must be implemented by the member states. So it's, it's uh, an obligation. And, um, Several articles we wrote in the last years um, are discussing this process of harmonization of landscape planning and nature conservation policies across Europe. The positive effects like an improvement of monitoring or public participation on one hand. And on the other hand, we also look at the negative aspects, for example, the uh, problems that local people have with new European regulations when they are used to their form of public participation, for example, or changes in the re regional situation and the planning processes there. So, if you talk about the SEA, the Strategic Environmental Assessment, you first think about the EIA. And I would like to start um, my presentation with looking back the last 25 years on this directive and the process we went through this to understand later on, I hope so, better the development we are facing now. When I was in between my PhD in 1986, um, I had the feeling that we are facing a bright future and we will earn a lot of money in the future because the European Union released the directive, you see it here, in 1985. Um, on the assessment of the effects of certain public and private projects on the environment. Uh, and we had a feeling that this will change the planning processes across Europe and there will, landscape planners as we are, will have to, a lot to do in the future. So this was perceived as one of the most important instruments uh, of a foresight environmental uh, protection. And I will go with you through the steps of the last 25 years to see what has happened with that instrument. Um, in 1996, I was in a research cooperation with the University in Innsbruck and the European Ac Academy in Bozen in Italy to study the status of the environmental impact assessment in the Alpine area, so a very sensitive environment, mountains, lakes, and um, a lot of biodiversity to protect. So we were focused on the application in that area, and we have seen a lot of deficiencies and um, aspects to criticize, such as um, important Alpine Pacific projects were not listened, li listened, like large hotels, golf courts, and so on. Or sensitive ecosystems were not considered, or the threshold values were too high. There was a threshold on hotels, but the threshold was very high. And um, also deficiencies in the impact studies and the public involvement and so on. This sounds very theoretical, and therefore I would like to show that with, with some pictures and some concrete examples. So the legislation in Austria which also have to adapt to this directive was like this, that in 1995 only accommodation businesses with more than 1,000 bed must be assessed. So if you have only 999 hotel beds, then no EIA is required. 
And um, when we wrote that book on the uh, EIA in the Alpine area, we tried to find one, at least one hotel in this size, but it was not possible, not with the help of travel agencies and so on. So in the average, we found uh, 90 beds in, even in tourism destinations and maximum 280 beds. So it was quite clear that the threshold was, was made by the politicians in order to have no assessment concerning hotels. It w this was uh, quite visible for the European Union and uh, how the tactic of different countries um, or the politicians behave in different countries, so they had a new directive in 1997 and they tried to harmonize the conditions and introduce a minimum, kind of minimum standard, support sustainable development and to put also the member states under pressure to change their legal situation. And we have a look now in this advanced uh, assessment and, and legal duties in Austria today. So at the moment, you have projects which require always an EIA, like nuclear power plants or highways. And if we look back at our hotel examples, now uh, hotels with more than 500 beds, um, if it's planned outside the settlements, have to have an assessment. It is still quite high, and um, when I'm teaching the EIA lessons, I ask my students to find those hotels who will bring a website with a hotel with 500 beds just planned. Um, I, will, I will offer a cake for the whole class, but um, the last two years nothing happens. Um, I hope I'm still safe. Uh, the projects with the EIA duty also occurs if you are in a sensitive environment, for example, above tree line. So last year I asked them to find a hotel with 250 beds above tree line, but they were not successful. Uh, but you have the feeling something has changed and um, if you compare that to um, Germany, the legislation in Germany, which is just across the border, same environment, same structure of hotels and landscape, uh, here you find uh, that you have to check uh, the uh, HUT if you find 80 beds, you plan 80 beds, then you have to decide it's a sensitive environment and you have to make one or not. Uh, or if you are over 200 beds, you have in any case to make an EIA. So see, uh, it's not difficult to know in which country a tourism plays a larger role, I guess. So this is the background. And uh, a lot of people thought it's already too late if you start thinking on the level of the EIA, for example, if you're planning a road or have an existing road from a village A to B, and you're thinking about alternatives and other um, options and you're discussing that in EIA it's maybe already too late you may be optimizing a wrong already wrong uh, solution so that was the discussion whether you have to have a strategy beforehand and to check that for example uh, to discuss also public transportation or other solutions uh, to get from A to B so that is the basic idea behind the SEA um, because if a hotel planning is already um, started, uh, it's too late to discuss alternatives, alternative solutions or alternative um, places, locations. Um, so the basic principles of the SEA, which, are, which I found also in the North American literature, is that it's focused on strategies, it's proactive, so it tries to optimize uh, positive actions before decisions are made. Uh, it's thinking very much in alternatives and con contributes to mitigation um, negative impacts. And its best effects are if it's integrated in the overall planning process so that the results of the SEA are implemented uh, directly in the decision-making process of the plan or program. So <coughs> now it's getting a little bit dry because we have to look into the legal documents from the European Commission. Um, that we can later on compare what the different countries, how the different countries react and what they um, did or what, what they understanding of the ideas from the SEA directive. So it was started in 2001 and uh, all the member states have had time until 2004 to implement it in their legislation. 
So I just want to highlight in these articles, just highlight one or two aspects um, to each subject. So plans and programs are all those which are subject to preparation and are adoption by an authority. Uh, and or which are prepared by an authority and which, require, which are required by legislative, regulatory, administrative provisions. So this is the first requirement. You see all, all the instruments by administration like uh, transportation plans, for example, or energy plans uh, would be covered by that. Second, that's quite interesting because a lot often in the North American literature it's divided between uh, regional or spatial SEA and uh, sectoral SEA. So what you see here is that the basic idea of the European SEA is a sectoral one. Uh, but if you think about country planning and the land use, it's quite clear that uh, it also has also a spatial uh, dimension. So all those types, you see agriculture, forestry, fishery, energy, uh, and so on, are meant by as plans and programs. Then if, if your plan would prepare the establishment of a project which has an, SE, an EIA requirement, um, must be, there must be an SEA beforehand. And the uh, third aspect is for um, variable habitats protected by Natura 2000 sites that is similar to a Species at Risk Act. So the next aspect um, you need to know is that there are some, some ideas from the European Commission um, that the member states can have an influence to decide uh, whether they would like to have a case-by-case -case examination or setting up types of plans and programs or combining the two aspects. Uh, so they have here the option to uh, d define their own relevant criteria. And uh, exceptions are, they are listed in the directive, if you have small cases, if, you, if your plan has only m minor changes, for example, then you this could be an exception you may define as a member state. And secondly, which is uh, often the case, plans and programs um, uh, where which deal with uh, national defense or civil emergency and financial and budget plans are not meant by the directive. The key, the key uh, document is the environmental report. There are pages and also a special annex how the environmental report must be written and that it should be transparent and uh, include for explicitly the uh, reasonable alternatives and likely significant effects on the environment and that it should be integrated in an early state and so on. Uh, this is underlined also again in the directive um, at uh, other pages especially also which deal with the publication involvement of other member states or the cross-border uh, uh, participation, for example. And uh, last issue which is mentioned, mentioned in the directive is monitoring. I highlight this because monitoring plays a very small role in planning processes um, beforehand. And uh, the European Union tries to implement that in many planning um, directives, planning related directives now. So like the water framework directive or the conservation directive dealing with Natura 2000. So if you would ask me how, in which fields application takes place at the moment, I try to um, uh, check that. It was quite difficult because you have to go uh, through different sectors. And what I found is that um, the example from Germany can be transferred also to other member states. That's frequent and continuous application takes place uh, in the field of spatial planning and regional development plans, as well as EU structural plans, programs and funds, and in water management programs. There are some applications in the field of transportation, plans uh, in forest plans and few only in agriculture and mining plans. And um, 
there's also a permanent discussion that a lot of authorities argue that they, they are not meant by the directive. For example, a coastal plan was mentioned in that case at the moment. There's a discussion going on in Germany towards an energy plan uh, with renewing energy and so on. Well, this should be checked by an SEA or not. So the authorities often try to escape um, to say it open. Uh, why the, the, the first three one are so often checked there has um, several reasons. One is that spatial planning uh, is explicitly mentioned in the directive and it's always something which has been done by the authorities so there is no escape. And the second aspect, the EU structural plan is quite clear. The EU only gives money if you have an SEA. And therefore we will look in the following in two case studies in these two, uh, in two cases um, from spatial planning and from these uh, EU programs in research. So the implementation by the member states might be of interest if you think about the Canadian situation if the federal government uh, would have an idea of implementing the SEA and then British Columbia must uh, adopt it so that you could imagine the same situation in Europe when Brussels have the idea and then um, the, uh, the member states like Austria, Germany, Italy must implement it. So we have many versions and I would like to show you the different approaches of the countries. But you must have in mind that we are talking all about the same environment. There are no differences between, uh, let's say, this region of, uh, of Tyrol and then the other side of in, in Bavaria or here in the National Park in Berchtesgaden and the Salzburg area um, uh, cross border or here are the areas uh, from northern Italy, mountain, mountains or the, the French Alpine area. So the environment is always the same, high biodiversity, wonderful, beautiful landscapes and a lot of cultural treasure also. So if you look at sp spatial planning, we uh, have here in most of the countries three main levels. One thinking on a, with a development plan on the provincial or country level. In France it's more country level, in Austria and in Italy and in Germany it's more province um, level. Then you have regional plans, that is one level beyond. And then you have on the community level the spatial development concept in some countries, in all countries somewhat like land use planning, zoning planning, master planning. And if these plans are obligatory in the nation, then the, the um, SEA directive must be applied. That's quite interesting. When the SEA directive came, Austria said, oh, that's quite nice. Then the construction plan is no longer obligatory. So then we don't have an SEA here. So a very good trick to um, avoid the SEA on that level. In Germany, you need to have always a construction plan, so you need to have, even for one house, you need to have a, an SEA. So that we have the same understanding what is meant by these, uh, um, these master planning processes as an overall concept of settlement structure, economic, touristic development, social infrastructure, traffic rate infrastructure, recreational spaces and so on, give you just uh, an insight in how those plans look like and that they are on the regional level as well as on the community level quite various and uh, have all the spatial issues included. So it's not so much a sectoral plan. So you have here the agricultural areas, you have industrial development, housing areas and so on and you have to decide in which, which are your goals, your future goals and you have to decide in which parts you would like to have a future development. You may have many alternatives and options like is uh, symbolized by these red and green uh, dots and the question is do you need the support of a strategic impact assessment to make your right decision for the future on a local level as well on a regional level and is the SEA able to help you in that case? And um, then afterwards define uh, on a specific level, find the right uh, solutions for, let's say, a small village like that one, develop that in a housing zone or to keep that as a kind of green island in the landscape. <coughs> so we checked in the Alpine area, in research projects, the, um, the plains in four countries. Um, you see here, that's the, the 
um, Flächennutzungsplan in Germany and uh, the Piano Regulatore Comunale in Italy. So in, in different instruments, but all dealing with the same, in, on the same level with this spatial development. And, and if we look at, when we look at the juridical implementation, we see that it's quite different. And that is normal for the directives because each member state can decide in which law, whether they develop an SEA law like Italy did, or whether they put that in existing um, special planning um, legal background, as it has been in Germany, or you make the two things so it's very complicated in Italy because you have that again in the uh, regions implemented and then you have again in subject law, that means in the building law again, uh, some paragraphs related to the SEA. So it's a quite complicated solution compared to France where it's only in one legal document relating to um, this special development. Then another question is quite interesting. You, you have seen that in directive, the EU opens the door to say, please define member state, define by yourself what is the best solution for you. Whether you would like to say, okay, an SEA is required, or whether you would like to implement a screening process. So a process where you define thresholds or special cases where an SEA is required or not. And um, here are the different options that the member state has, for example, related to Article 2 and 3, where they can say, okay, not for small cases, or uh, defining then thresholds if it is uh, close to a national park or it, if it is in a, in a flooding area and so on. And uh, the solutions were quite interesting. So um, France and Germany said, we don't make it too complicated. Uh, so more or less, we, uh, an, e an SEA is always helpful. We need to have that in most cases. In other countries like Austria try to hinder it as, as, as good as possible, you can say. So they try to avoid the um, implementation and use of the SEA. <coughs> There's one exception, that's Vienna. Vienna has always even started with SEA process before the directive uh, was there. In Germany, there is only the each spatial development, each changes have to be checked in Germany. Exceptions are only in the development, so between, if you have a development already between buildings. Italy has also a complex and critical uh, seating pr uh, screening procedure, and Fran in France is a situation similar to the uh, German situation. So one directive, one instrument, one formulation and a very complex and different um, understanding in the member states. <coughs> so therefore we would like to see the next step whether this, uh, the idea from the SEA to help the member states to make a good decision, environmental friendly decisions um, is okay, and if the uh, precautionary principle um, is really uh, the main or the, uh, the main thing, it is amazing making processes also. So you see that uh, in Austria, overall, the low contribution to planning processes, the high thresholds are hindering an application. So there are a complex screening system. You have to calculate points in the different uh, provinces. So you get three points if you are in a flooding zone and if you have then overall eight points, then you, you might have, uh, you have to do the SEA, but then you have to check so many documents that uh, it's quite ridiculous. You don't save any time with this procedure. Uh, and a lot of planners perceive that as a double work. In France, it's quite a good application. Uh, it's ma mainly applied on a conceptual regional level where the decision making process and the thinking alternative is very important. In Germany, you have seen no screening requirements. It simplifies the application very much. It is therefore also well accepted by the public because it shows alternatives. The history of plans also and the history of decisions and the monitoring is well accepted by the public. And in Italy, it's quite complicated. There's always a competition between the provinces like South Tyrol or Venezio um, and Rome. So they would like to, 
to be as um, uh, independent from Rome as possible. And on the other hand, Rome tries to have an influence and that leads to a very complicated legal situation and difficult application and also um, negative effects on the acceptance. <coughs> So I would like to give you an insight on a very good process and high acceptance, even uh, the case, it is the case that in recent publication in Germany it's written that we don't have to talk about the SEA in special development because everything is clear. And, and we would say in German it's absolutely cold coffee, you would say it's already an old hat. It's well accepted in special planning uh, and there's a good implementation. It's a good implementation because many regions have developed, like you can see it here, what we have done for Bavaria um, um, guideline for communities, administration planners, uh, which were very practical uh, with uh, a lot of examples. You see here some pages out of this uh, brochure where you find here the environmental issues, then here the um, results uh, of your evaluation and here are listed mitigation measures and uh, the reason why you have selected here the uh, evaluation result. It's very simple also for the decision makers. They can, they can get an overview on this overall situation. They can compare different locations, different alternatives easily. This is for the housing, but it's also, for example, for an issue we're discussing at the moment very much uh, wind turbines, photovoltaic, solar fields, and all those kind of things. Uh, there is even included a tool to calculate the required spatial compensation. That would be a separate uh, presentation how this uh, works. And um, to conclude in, in that um, case study, uh, looking at the spatial uh, development and um, the spatial planning, I would say guidelines and checklists are important elements of the implementation. So Salzburg um, have compared the situation to Bavaria and they will switch their procedure in the future. They will also have a new guideline and implement the SEA better than other Austrian provinces. Uh, the environmental reports um, lead due to the directive and due to the guidelines um, to a better quality, which is, which is actually noticeable. And the benefits I see also for the public, it's, it's much more transparent. Uh, there's improved consideration of alternatives and um, also more expert knowledge uh, included. So it's nice when you can understand which decisions are made and why and what has been taken into consideration. So the other example is quite quite dry. <laughs> it's what, what I discussed with Mary, Mary beforehand at the phone and he said that is quite the most interesting uh, application if you think about if you think about programs. And as I said before, the EU requires if they give money in a, st a structural program like here, a research program for the Alpine area, if you set up this research, research program, you only get money if you have an SEA. And uh, we from the Institute were asked to, uh, um, to care about this uh, SEA and uh, at the beginning we said we have no clue how to do it. You will see why that was so complicated because um, I would like to show you what does the research program look like and I ask you to, to read here some of those lines that are the objectives, the main objectives of that research uh, call you must imagine a research call with these objectives and some, some uh, indicators as well. Um, and this is the basis and that would be checked by the SEA. So um, the, the idea uh, to enhance uh, here um, sustainable development and you know all some nice, nice wordings supporting creative ideas and solutions. So how to economic innovation, these are these smoothly nice saying nothing words that we would say, so complicated. So we started the SEA by thinking how we can do so. You have the content list in the directive, so that is your backbone for your study and we started uh, using that. If you look at the main objectives, you have seen one. S second thing is the aims 
for the environmental protection in the alpine area. That is quite easy. There are a lot of studies dealing with this sensitive environment. So here it was easy to define the aims for each environmental issue. It was easy to um, add that with maps and to describe the environmental characteristics of the alpine area. Though that was, was very easy to do. Then it starts to get complicated uh, when we should discuss the likely significant environmental effects implementing the program. So we started here a workshop with the task force and other experts uh, which were um, helping this task force to develop this research program and we tried to get answers on all those typical scoping questions like the spatial scope, the planning horizon, the, the contents and so on to get an insight um, of their thinking. But what turned out was quite interesting, the task force was absolutely not convinced that this SEA process leads to anything. So they were, were uh, convinced that this is just work for the work and uh, they have to have it and to have to send that to the European Commission to get, to commission to get that program accepted and get the research money, uh, but that's it. And um, we, then we started to develop this kind of scoping list. So you see here the strategic aim of the program, then the aims for implementation, so what are the key issues. And then you see here that we try, even it's so weak, we try to uh, find indicators like increase of ceiling, increase of building and commercial land or deterioration of groundwater, impact on surface water and so on to, to get a kind of insight what these what this, uh, weak um, aims uh, could mean and wh which type of practical consequences they could have. So we agreed this scoping list with the other member states, Alpine member states. And then we were thinking how, how we can make a transparent environmental study where people can understand why we judge and evaluate this in one hand or the other. And therefore we said we must, for each of those main aims and objectives, we must develop somewhat like, like a background or a main understanding or a definition what we understand by uh, sustainable growth, which is uh, already a difficult uh, term to combine these two aspects in the field of housing development, for example. So we try to uh, evaluate what is the main understanding in that field, what normal people would think about these terms, what is the scientific background, and uh, we evaluated the, the pro program period beforehand, so what typically the researchers or the research content was in the previous um, applications to see in which, te which tendency those um, uh, applications might have. And then against this background we could do the evaluation. Uh, it's to highlight that we did the worst case principle, so uh, we, we are thinking what could happen in um, a negative scenario and um, then the interrelationships between the environmental issues and then also synergetic or cumulative environmental effects. I would like to sh underline that and, and illustrate a little bit in this example. This is uh, the objective 734, managing the impact of climate change and natural and technical hazards. So here we looked at all the previous research uh, applications. You see here the acronyms from those. And uh, we try to um, describe the state of the art in that research field. And uh, then we developed, or, or we, we agreed in, in our team that the risk of technological hazards has not been mentioned so much in the previous uh, application that is in the directly in the focus, so that we have to expect that this will be one of the main issues in the future. And therefore, we, if you think about technical improvements like uh, dams hindering flooding and so on, then you, you can understand that there might be a lot of negative in the worst case scenario impacts on fauna, uh, vegetation, biodiversity, as well as on uh, surface water. So here another example, a positive uh, ones. You have here the environmental issues, 
Um, this is um, a research dealing with more with marketing, communication, information, um, and uh, best practice example, communication of best practice examples. So here we don't see any, any negative uh, impacts on environmental issues. So you see here um, positive uh, descriptions. So that leads, and he here another example um, highlighted in different colors, uh, description, why we judge that here slightly negative or high negative. And at the end, we show up with this um, uh, over overview, have to present that to the European Commission as well as to the uh, task force for the Alpine area. And you see here two objectives were quite, quite critical. So it was implemented in the development process. So at that stage, we said, take care. Here you have two objectives which turn out to be uh, medium or high negative. And you see the right one is more or less overall medium negative. Strengthening the role of urban areas as en energy engines for sustainable growth. So we, we thought that is about uh, enlarging of the centers and they are already uh, causing a lot of environmental problems. So here in a session, we, we argued these differences. And what was very interesting is that the first approach of the task force wa was change the colors. It turns out too negative. So could you make it in a slight yellow, please? Uh, and um, I would say if, if you would be an employed planner um, and you would like to have another assessment later on, you might have changed the colors. So I said, I'm sorry, uh, I will lose my reputation if I would change the colors. Um, so I'm sorry, it will stay red. A at least you might have to change the wording or the direction of your objectives. You might, uh, there might be research fields in urban areas which uh, are really contributing to sustainable development, um, but at the moment we can't see it. And that really helps, and that really was, a, was leading to a good discussion um, after the first approach. And um, that is one aspect we have highlighted also in the publication, that this personal influence is often overlooked. It's not about evaluation at all. It's also about standing for the results and, and the main finding and discussing them and showing them options for mitigation and um, improvement of the paper. So um, overall, with uh, several uh, loops, I think uh, the SEA could contribute uh, to an improvement um, of this plan. So I, I come to the end and to some conclusions and lessons learned as far as I can do it now. You have seen, hopefully, that we are far away from a harmonized planning culture or that we are really doing what the, what the EU is trying um, to implement in Europe. Uh, the acceptance decreases extremely when the SEA is applied on a program or higher planning level. Local people have no understanding that a regional decision will later on come to their ground. So it's so, f so far from their thinking, so you have nearly no public participation. Uh, on, and that is perceived as a problem, especially for that, that higher planning levels. Uh, the low acceptance by administration and politicians often lead to late consideration and less influence on decision-making processes. Some planners are talking about invented alternatives. <gasps> We have to, to work out the SEA, uh, the chapter alternatives is still open. You have one, think about one, Inve you, we should invent one uh, and not uh, based, the decision is not based on the, the evaluation of the alternatives. The improvements from monitoring are often not perceived, yet we have a lot of problems with the monitoring in Europe. But I think the positive experience from spatial planning should enhance the, at the moment, rather slow application process. The SEA is a precondition, from my point of view, for sound environmental planning and sustainable land use. Thank you very much for listening and for that dry stuff. Thank you for your talk, Ulrike. I really enjoyed it. Um, 
I was curious when you started off and were describing the kinds of assessments that you were looking at, the description of them as environmental assessments, and my, the first question that came to my mind was whether it included any aspect of social impact assessment. And then when I saw some of your matrices, particularly the assessment of the research process, uh, you mentioned human health assessment and population, and then there was something about heritage structures. Are those specified in the requirements for assessment, or the, were those, in other words, are those specified at the European Union level, or were those specified in the specific project you were working on? And to what extent does the European Union level directives require social impact assessment? No, the social impact assessment uh, is, is uh, not included at all. It's really focusing on environmental issues. And the only, the only aspect, uh, what, you second, uh, what you mentioned um, also, the cultural heritage, yes, this is included. This is also perceived as um, uh, one of the main environmental issues all the time, and also material assets like bridges or uh, public buildings. So this, these two aspects are included, but not um, but not the social, social impact and social impact assessment is not included. But those aspects are considered to be environmental attributes? No. No, the social aspect and the, and the environmental issues are, are completely separated, also on the EIA level. So it, and in the legal, the, it, it, the only aspect is that you have the um, Schutzgutmensch, so the the, the issue people and then you have noise effects and then you have recreation, for example, opportunities also in the, in the EIA aspect. But not social aspects such as um, mixed population, um, then income, migration and, and problems and all those, those other kinds of things. Economic relevance, um, uh, working opportunities and so on. So only these environmental issues which, which have a negative impact on your health conditions such as noise or vibrations or, yeah, or dust. <laughs> I was sitting. Thank you very much for your, for your talk. Uh, I have a, you just mentioned something about harmonization. So uh, we had a recent case in BC, uh, a conflict over a mining case. There was a conflict between the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act and the BC Provincial Act. So I was wondering now in, in the European Union, it's, it seems that you have three levels. You have the EU, you have the, the country, and then you may have a province thing also. I was wondering if, the, if you could shed some light about reconciliation or you know, how do these processes fit in with each other? Mm -hmm. So the EU only gives the directives, so the legal background can say the framing condition, legal framing conditions. So how you, what your planning instrument should look like. And then the member state can decide, for example, to make uh, a national law or a provincial law, or like it in Italy, the two. Uh, so th this is your national decision. And the EU don't, doesn't have any influence on, let's say, mining or, or agricultural decisions. They only uh, would like to underline that this procedure or this transparency by these planning instruments is required uh, and necessary. And you as a member state can then decide. And th the reason is uh, that when you compare and you find those different thresholds and you find the different applications and you find that Germany perceived the SEA as a helpful tool in spatial planning and Austria perceived it as a hindering tool. And um, so you see then also in their legal implementation why they have done the one or the other. Um, so there is no direct influence of the European Union. And whether the provin provincial level or the national level is relevant, it depends on your history. So France is totally top down. So the decisions and framing uh, legal requirements are made in Paris. And they have to be applied in uh, Lausanne in the same, in the same way. Um, Besides that, Austria is extremely complicated. You have n nine tiny provinces and they have in nature conservation and special development their own laws and no framing law from on the national level. So that is 
super complicated and similar in, in Italy. So that depends on your, on your history how this is implemented. Thank you, Ulrike. Um, it sort of follows up from the last question because I was wondering about border regions and obviously um, if different countries are interpreting the regulations differently, what happens, uh, for example, if there are lower thresholds that affect things like rivers that cross boundaries? Is, th is there any regulation then from the EU or do you know of any examples where um, in terms of, say, wildlife territory, they don't know where the national boundaries are. Are there, are there any particular issues that would come out of these different interpretations across nations? So this different interpretation is an, is an issue. It's an issue especially for entrepreneurs or for also, uh, let's say, cross-border electricity lines, for example. If you, if in one country you have uh, an EIA requirement and the other you don't have, or uh, not in that intensity, or you may have to make um, environmental reports which have to look different in the different parts. I in Austria, even in the provinces, different, which is for the national uh, um, energy um, uh, entrepreneur something which they call this is silly. It's the only term they have for that. On the other hand, if you're in the tourism business, which might interest you, is it's also a problem. If you are a hotel owner and you are on the Austrian side, you don't have to have the SEA. And if you're the other side, you have to spend about 50,000 euro extra for that assessment. And you see why. It's the same environment. There are also positive reactions in the way that uh, the conservation and the spatial planning is very strict in Germany. That means that the, that the area mm -hmm. outside settlements is very much protected. And so one hotel owner from Austria, which bought a um, hotel in Germany, said that is quite nice. I, I thought it, the, the German uh, planning uh, tools are quite, quite complicated and expensive. But on the long term, he said, it's great because my hotel will be standing alone forever. And I don't, in, in Austria, I might be afraid that there will be some deals and they will ha allow some other hotels at that special location. In Germany, I feel much more safe. So it, it depends. But overall, um, I think for many um, enterprises, it's not to understand um, why you have so high differences, which are here between 200 beds and 500 beds, which is, uh, which is a lot. You know what, if you have, well, I'm not sure I can articulate my question clearly. Uh, has, SEA has come around the last couple decades, I guess, but we've had, you know, something like the North Sea Oil, they've been developing oil for a long period of time, and you could perhaps call that a program or a plan, even though it's a bunch of different nations. In, in EU law or in the EU experience, has there been any application of SEA tools to things that are already happening and I guess my question too comes down to what's the definition of plan or program does that make any sense my question mm -hmm. <laughs> now one one idea and this is quite also discussed in literature whether you should have regional approaches and assess what is will be changed in the future like uh, uh, oil or or mining uh, processes and so on. Uh, or if you have to think in sectoral plans, like a mining plan by itself or an uh, energy plan by itself. Um, and th the second aspect is that the EU has foreseen that you might have had a plan in the past, but you may change it or add things. So if you will have, you might have in the past a plan on, on mining issues, uh, you will you will have a next period and then you will have further decisions to make and then you have to apply uh, the SEA for that. So uh, as I said, a plan is um, the be it, when an authority makes a decision for the future development. So that is perceived as a plan or a program. And then you can say it's this more sectoral thinking or it's more... Uh, um, spatial thinking, but, but it's a future development. And so I would say even there are existing concepts and you would like to enlarge them or 
to go in a new direction, then uh, these changes, uh, like with spatial planning, uh, ch changes in spatial planning, they will have to be assessed in that way. Um, when I looked at these oil uh, development plans, there was well, the idea, uh, can we combine that with conservation issues? So um, not analyzing the main impacts, but the strategy to say, okay, we know the impacts, but will we deal or won't we deal? And that, is, that has for me kind of, was for me kind of strange because that was already a compromise, uh, an assessment of possible compromises, wherever the compromise is feasible, I, I don't know. But if you look at those, those strategic assessments uh, in, in, in Canada concerning the oil sands. So I found that interesting to, to assess a, a, a maybe possible compromise. Okay, well, I think our time is about up, so I'd like to thank Ricky uh, thank for you, your talk and for your questions. And uh, we'll close this now and look forward to having you here the next time we have this speaker.